Okay, today I have with me Alun Aragon. Alun, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Juma. Thank you very much for having me. Great to hear. Uh, before we start to talk about flexible versus strict dieting, could you give us a sh brief introduction about yourself, what your background is, how you got involved in the fitness industry, and what you currently work with? Okay. Well, many years ago, um, I was a I was a trainer, fitness trainer, and then I gradually sort of evolved into being a nutritional counselor, and then from that I evolved into being a, a, a researcher and a lecturer and a writer. So um, I was able to take my experience with personal training and nutritional counseling and apply it to research questions and work with great guys like Brad Schoenfeld, James Krieger, uh, and a, a bunch of other good folks, good scientists on research that looks at things like athletic performance and or changes in body composition, um, the whole kind of sports nutrition and exercise realm and fitness type of realms is sort of the research that I focus on. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, you can look up my publications on, on PubMed, just do a search on Aragon AA, <laughs> you'll get them all. Um, I have a bunch of publications uh, in the um, Journal of the International Society of Sports Nutrition, or JISSN. So you can just search my name in there and you'll find a bunch of open access publications that you don't have to shell out money to, to read or go through you know, the dark web to get. <laughs> so. Um, so yeah, uh, and what's been a really fun evolution of my career is lecturing at, at conferences for um, the professionals in the field. And so that's been a really fun thing. And that's kind of where I'm at. Excellent. And, you, and you're, uh, you're a great speaker as well. We heard you do your lecture at the AFBT convention in Oslo, Norway in September. And that was, that was awesome. Thank you very much. I had a really great time doing that. And Norway is just such an incredible place. And the memorable thing about Norway is the clean water. So I the really clean appreciate water. it. Yeah, that's, that's what the, usually people say about Norway, the clean water. Clean water and the fresh air. And the beautiful people. <laughs> and the beautiful people as well. Okay, so <clears throat> the topic today is flexible versus strict dieting. Um, the fitness industry seems to be divided between two camps today where you have the strict dieters that focus on clean foods and only have a selection of food that they include in their diet. And then you have the people that have a more flexible approach to the diet and follow uh, IIFYM. And I believe you were there when the acronym IIFYM, if it fits your macros, was, uh, was made. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that and what the difference is between the two um, philosophies of the two camps? Yeah, that is a pretty simple thing. This was back in 2009 on the bodybuilding.com nutrition forums, where, as you can imagine, there are threads posted by people new to the game asking if this food or that food is okay to eat while they're trying to lose fat or while they're in a cutting cycle or a cutting phase. And there was any food you can think of that was posted within the context of the question, can I eat this while I'm cutting? Can I eat that while I'm cutting? And just as an example, foods like uh, God, anything, bread, white rice, white potatoes, um, cheese, peanut butter, uh, chicken, <laughs> beef, <laughs> these normal freaking foods. Can, can I have red meat while I'm cutting? You know, you hear stuff like that. And of course, you also hear things like, can I have peanut butter while I'm cutting? Can I have chocolate while I'm cutting? So what we did was instead of posting, if it fits your macronutrient targets or if it fits your macros, then go ahead and eat that food. Just make sure you have an awareness of your total calories and the macronutrition that comprises um, the, that total caloric allotment. And then you'll still lose fat, even if there's some white bread in your diet. You'll still lose fat, 
even if there's some white rice in your diet, you'll still lose fat even if there's some peanut butter in your diet. So Eric Kohnreich was the guy who came up with the idea of posting IIFYM instead of saying it, all, you know, typing the whole thing out. If it fits your macro targets, then go ahead and have that food. So he thought of just posting IIFYM as a joke almost because there were so many threads that were posted about, you know, can I eat fruit while I'm cutting? Can I, can I, is it okay if I eat bananas while cutting? If it fits your macros, go ahead and eat that food. So what happened from that point was an interesting thing because people took the IIFYM acronym and turned it into this diet that was promoting junk food. <laughs> and I'm not exactly sure why that happened, but my guess is that people uh, tend to think in black and white terms. So if it's not 100% clean food, it's got to be 100% shit food. And so IIFYM attracted a, 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 a faction of, of, the, of the fitness population who gravitated towards eating crap food. And so, you know, this small group of, of, of people sort of tainted or promoted the wrong idea of, of what IIFYM really sort of stood for was just a shorthand way of saying, be aware of your macros. And have an awareness of the type of food that you're eating. And yeah, you can you can eat whole eggs. You know, you don't have to eat just egg whites. Just fit the egg yolks into the uh, the macro allotment for dietary fat. That's what IIFYM was about. It's it wasn't about okay, eat all your carbs in the form of pop tarts and Jolly Rancher candies. You know, it's never never supposed to be like that. So, what happened? You got the the bros and the dedicated. Uh, competitive bodybuilders hearing the IIFYM, well, not all the IIFYM guys, just the, the guys who took it to the extreme, hearing them brag about, oh man, today I had 12 scoops of whey and uh, and and 12 pop tarts and, and a couple, you know, and a few capsules of fish oil. Man, I hit my macros, bam, you know, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> of course that's going to annoy people, and of course that's. That's not the optimal thing for uh, long-term health, and that's where the battle started happening. You know, the bros are, are going around with their tup Tupperwares of tilapia and broccoli and sweet potato, or maybe the big one is asparagus now. Your piss has got to smell extreme in order for you to have an extreme <laughs> tea. So, you know, the, the, those bros got really mad at the IAFYM guys. Um, when the fact of the matter is, uh, the IIFYM thing is really meant to give you some kind of uh, perspective or foundation because there there is a hierarchy of things that matter as far as what changes body composition. And so um, at the bottom of the hierarchy, and this is a really cool thing, Eric Helms is uh, actually putting out a formal um, product that sort of pieces all of this stuff together. But at the bottom are the calories and the macronutrients. And then up towards the top, you know, you got food choices and the timing of food choices and stuff. So, um, without being too rambly, that that is kind of what it is all about, and um, it, it's complicated because people put their emotions into the the whole argument and start throwing personal shots at. Oh yeah, oh well, what do you know, man? You're not big. <laughs> what do you know, man? <laughs> Where's your trophies? You know that sort of thing, but. It is a scientific discussion, and so when you keep it scientific, uh, it's entirely possible to reach physique goals by not necessarily focusing on food choices per se. If your macronutrition is on point, uh, I would add that for for, for a long term health goal, um, you also have to make sure that the quality of your diet is on point as well. And this is something that some some of the extreme IFYMers are in denial of that food choices do matter. Uh, diet quality does matter but the a, a lot of the sensible guys who know about the importance of macronutrition will agree that diet quality matters and the junk food allotment of any any given diet for the purpose of optimizing long long term health is is a relatively small allotment and there's a lot of gray area it's it's hard to draw um uh you know hard lines about what percentage of the diet can come from crap or not but generally speaking, it's like a 10 to 20 percent uh, uh, margin of YOLO type of foods. And then you got this 80 to 90 <clears> percent <throat> uh, remainder there. 
of, of the diet that should come from whole foods and minimally processed foods in order to take advantage of the health benefits of, of these types of foods. So, so it's not, have. yeah, so it's not just the macronutrients that you should focus on. You should also focus on to eat food that uh, will provide you with the macronutrients that you, you need as well. And that's how the misconception got out of hand with the, if it fits your macros, because people started only to focus on hitting the macros and forgot a bit about the food quality as well. But you mentioned that 10 to 20, 10 to 20% could be YOLO food and the rest of it should be food that will provide you with a lot of macronutrients as well. Yes, yeah. yes. And, and if someone chooses to have zero allotment for YOLO foods because they just don't like them, then, you know, of course, you're not supposed to force it. Um, and, you know, even if you didn't necessarily pay attention to food choice, if you didn't have this hyper focus on whole and minimally processed foods, but you have a focus on hitting um, your daily fiber requirements, like for most people, it's going to be, well, you know, anywhere from as low as 30 to 50-ish grams <clears throat> a day, then you're not going to hit that fiber allotment by having a bunch of refined foods in the diet. So, so yeah. I think it's uh, like, for example, how I work with, with clients, because I use the flexible diet approach with a lot of my clients. Uh, we set up certain amount of rules, included the macronutrients that they should follow. So they have a certain amount of fiber that sh they should eat, a certain amount of servings of uh, fruits and, and vegetables and berries that they also should eat uh, in the day. And that actually makes it more difficult to just eat junk food all day and hitting your your macros so yeah, yeah. that's a approach that i'm happy with with the, when i work with with my clients and it yeah. and it seems to work as well like i've had bikini models uh, on stage that use that approach and do great so uh, apparently you don't have to eat chicken breast rice and broccoli to make it to the stage as well no, no, you don't. And there are people who sincerely believe that there are, are differences in like these, these really small differences that would make some kind of an impact on, on how you look on stage. But Like, e no, like eating uh, orange roughy, only <laughs> orange roughy in the last four weeks before on stage so you can thin out the skin? Oh, yeah, yeah. Switch over to fish. Know, towards uh, you know towards the contest, thin the skin. Yeah. It was really funny. Uh, um, Brad Schoenfeld and I were having a conversation with with a group of guys who really believed that, and they really believed that red meat kind of filled them out in the off season. Uh, but then you switch over to fish um, the last six to eight ish weeks, the final stretch of uh, pre contest, and you thin out the skin. And Brad, kidding around, he's like, "Okay, well, why don't you keep the beef in there for pre contest to keep you full?" But then just supplement with fish oil to thin the skin, so you get the fullness of the beef and the thin skinness of the fish, and bam, you know you can win the Olympia one day. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was laughing to myself in the background, and these guys were seriously considering it because it's Brad Schoenfeld saying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Brad, Brad would would hear that and and laugh, but um, yeah, there's a lot of magic that people believe in as far as this thing goes. So, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's still uh, a lot of work to do to remove this uh, this bad information, if I could say it in, in that way. Sort of a yeah. bad, yeah. Mm. And okay. I, I would also add this, Juma. Mm. Um, for people dieting for a bodybuilding or a physique show, sometimes it's easier to just stick with a, a narrow list of foods and stick with the script because it leaves less room to mess things up mm. and it leaves less potential variation that might impact results. So I can totally see the value of uh, going with, in quotes, the six foods that work. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, it's just, uh, it keeps things simple and it minimizes the potential for error. Uh, it's not that it's healthy psychologically or physiologically, <laughs> not that it's optimal, but it is. Uh, it has its use from a minimizing the error potential standpoint. So I, I want to make sure that I throw that in there too. Okay, great. 
what would you say is the like we talked about the um, if it fits your macros approach and the pros of you following that diet is that you can actually include a lot more food in your diet by being flexible but what would you say is is uh, probably some some drawbacks to following that diet to following the flexible diet yeah <laughs> uh, some of the potential drawbacks of, of diets that are you know too I guess too flexible is that some people when you in introduce um, a lot of variety uh, then they can tend to, if, if they don't have the foundation correct that they have to work that variety within a certain framework of total calories and uh, and and macronutrition they can sort of go outside of the lines and underestimate the total amounts that they're taking in so that is a potential pitfall to flexible dieting but then again it can be argued that okay well then you're not really doing the flexible dieting correctly yeah. if you're messing yeah. up the, the amounts that you're taking in uh... you know the flip side of, of doing flexible dieting and, and taking in a, an, a rigid all-or-nothing approach to diet is that it's been seen several times now in research that a rigid uh, black or white all-or-nothing dietary approach is more closely correlated with uh, eating disorders with uh, with even um, problems uh, regulating body weight and it's even associated with overweight you know, the rigid style dieting and the failure to uh, uh, succeed in, in in weight loss and keeping the weight off so there <clears throat> there's a bunch of, of uh, peer-reviewed published studies now showing that uh, the comparison of rigid versus flexible dieting flexible dieting way more often than not uh, outperforms rigid dieting um, in the real world in the general population yeah. uh, as far as weight loss and weight loss maintenance goes so it apparently is a much more psychologically healthy way to go and apparently it's uh, a more effective way to go for people uh, who need to lose weight and keep it off in the long term yeah because a, yeah. Lot, of, a lot of people seem to you see in the research that a lot of people seem to regain the weight um, during the years after they've lost it, I think it's after five years they see that people have usually regained the weight that they lost. But yeah. uh, but um, there's an old study from Smith and colleagues from '93 where they actually compared this. They took um, strict dieters versus flexible dieting, and they saw that uh, the people that were more flexible with their diet. Uh, uh, achieved maintenance of the weight loss after they they've lost the weight so mm -hmm. you actually see in the research that a flexible approach seems to be better for maintaining the weight over time yeah. but uh, <clears throat> a lot of people seem to think that it might be a, a stressor because when you actually have to follow a flexible diet you need some sort of self-monitoring for example by using my fitness pal to log everything you eat would you say that that might be potentially a drawback to following a flexible diet because it puts more stress on the individual? I, yeah, for some people definitely, definitely. Uh, you have to assess the, the way that the diet is approached on an individual basis. So we'll take myself for example. Uh, I would absolutely hate to to track my my intake on on a on an app like my fitness pal and I would absolutely hate to weigh my food um, for me I would rather ballpark things visually but that of course involved a a learning process on how to do that and, and actually using the cups and you know being able to visualize uh, what these servings look like and you know I, I learned all of that stuff um, uh, in my formal dietitian uh, uh, curriculum which I went through in my undergrad and then you teach clients how to do this and then it, it's a pretty simple uh, pretty simple way of doing things now if people want to take things to another level of precision and weigh food and uh, you know track uh, on on let's say my fitness pal they enjoy that and they don't have a problem with it and they succeed on it and and they have this positive reinforcement of doing it and they don't find it to be stressful mm -hmm. then great that's their personality type and they'll succeed on it that way 
I would still encourage those folks who like to micromanage, I would still give them the bigger picture that the ultimate goal should be to not do that. <laughs> the ultimate goal would be to master uh, your diet without having to micromanage it. Yeah. So that's ultimately a healthier um, uh, spot to be in rather than carrying around a scale with you everywhere you go in my fitness pal, you know, at the ready. So. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree. But uh, I also think that it might be a good learning process to do it uh, at the start so that you actually can estimate the, the foods that you're eating because it can be difficult if you haven't weighed your food uh, before to actually okay, is this 200 grams of, of uh, pasta or is it 500 grams? Yeah, I, I agree with that. For people who don't eat a lot of uh, pre-determined serving, uh, pre, you know, pre-made serving sizes like a scoop of protein from your, from your protein powder tub, depending on the size of the scoop, is always going to be 25 to 30 grams. You know, uh, a packet of your meal replacement powder is going to be what it is every time. Okay. For people who don't eat that way, and for people who eat a, a lot of foods that are sort of mixed foods and things, I think that it can be quite helpful. And even for people who eat single ingredient type of foods, I totally agree with you that that beginning boot camp, if you will, of getting a, an objective awareness of what serving sizes equate to what macros, I think that that's a very valuable skill to have for, for somebody who wants to who wants to achieve some something other than just maintaining? Yeah. I've uh, also seen that there's uh, some research on this that you need some sort of self-monitoring to actually keep, keep the weight off. Not, we're talking about weight loss now, that when you lose the weight, you need some sort of self-monitoring, either you're tracking your calories or your macros or your activity level or your, your weight. And I totally agree that you shouldn't micromanage everything you do, but still you need some sort of self-monitoring that keeps you on, on track all the time. Because I totally agree with the approach you're, you're talking about. And usually what I do is that we start with the boot camp where we weigh stuff and use my, my fitness pal, but then we'll probably just make it a bit more flexible by, because if you have a package of, say 400 grams of ground beef, I'm not gonna ask my client to, to weigh that out if I've said that you should eat 200 grams for that meal. We just say, just take half the package and do stuff mm -hmm. like that to, to, to make it easier for the, for the client. Yeah, 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 I agree with that, man. I, I do, and uh, yeah, it, it, whenever somebody is wondering why progress isn't being made or if they're reaching a plateau and they feel like they're doing everything, then they really aren't doing everything or they really haven't exploited all of the possibilities until they find out objectively what's what in terms of the weight of the food and the serving size and, and what's going in. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, totally agreed on that. Yeah, because it's pretty common to underestimate what you, what you eat. Yeah, it's, it's really common to underestimate what you eat. And at the point you bring up about self-monitoring, there are a bunch of uh, correlates of long-term weight loss maintenance success. And one of the correlates is self-monitoring. And it can be as simple as a daily or weekly weighing in order, to, in order for the, the dieter to have an awareness of what's going on and some sort of reinforcement that, okay, Thing is going the way it's supposed to be going. So self-monitoring, and I believe it was daily weighing that was uh, one of the correlates of uh, long-term, long-term weight loss. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Al. This was this was actually perfect when when we talked about the flexible diet and trying to keep it as as short as as possible. Um, could you just give us some information about where people could find more about um, more information about your your articles I also know that you have written some some books and you also have a monthly research review yeah you can go to alanaragon.com that's a l a n a r a g o n dot com and there are links to my blog links to my uh, my books 
Uh, I've written two books, one in 2007 uh, and, and a, a recent one I just wrote last year with Lou Schuler. Uh, both books are, are I, I'm, I still like both of them. You know, usually when, when I write something, uh, some time passes, then I kind of hate it. But um, I, I still I still love both of the books. Uh, Growth Control is almost gosh, it's going to be a decade old in a, in a couple couple few years. So um, the information there is still valid in terms of the programming and stuff. Some of the research obviously is is outdated, uh, but a lot of the principles and the concepts are are still valid, and it's a good book. People are still making gains from it. You know, yeah, G A I. N Z Z Z games. Uh, <clears throat> you you signed one of those books, didn't you, at the the convention? One of the participants had the book with him. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> had girth control. Yeah, 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 the girth control. Yeah. The the newer book is called the Lean Muscle Diet. Uh, the one I, I wrote with Lou Schuler. It's a Rodale published men's health branded book. So that one's really cool because it's a lot more readable than than my my older book, and it's got some newer. Um, principles, newer research in there that's really put put together in a kind of like a quick digestible read for the the lay person as well. You know the the uh, uh, industry guys will appreciate the book as well. It's just really well written because Lou was the guy who who you know wrote <laughs> yeah. basically wrote it. Um, and my research review is my personal favorite uh, product or service that I've got, and it uh, it's a monthly. I guess you could call it a monthly journal or a monthly technical newsletter. I hate to call it a newsletter because if you call it a newsletter, it's like almost, you know, like calling a, a, an, F, an, an F-16 a flying object <laughs> or something. Yeah, um, so, so, yeah, my research review is, is designed to um, inform mainly the professionals, but I do have a, a big chunk of the subscribership who are, are the lay public who are just intensely interested in uh, exercise and nutrition. And so, so yeah, I've got that. Uh, there's links to that on my website as well. And, and uh, the only social media I'm active on is Facebook. I've tried to Twitter, but I don't even Twitter very well. I've tried to Instagram, and I'm just not, you know, Insta. I'm not Insta sexy enough for Instagram, so um, you know. So, so uh, I'm mainly active on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. And your research review is—it's uh, actually one of my favorites as well. I recommend it to all my students and uh, all my colleagues that haven't um, subscribed to it because it gives you—it it gives you an easy easy way to get new information especially if you're interested in specifically the the fitness industry so i highly recommend it to all the people that uh, i know that's in the industry and i think you actually have a quite a lot of subscribers from from norway that's awesome man yeah. and, and i do i do appreciate the kind words about my research review and it come it, it means a lot coming from somebody like yourself saying that so thank you Thank you so much. Okay, Alan, thank you so much once again for taking the time to do this and um, have a great day. Hopefully we could do this again on a, on a different topic. Definitely, definitely. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.